are you doing as this COVID-19 crisis unfolds? These past two weeks have been disruptive and disorienting. You may have had school, work, or vacation plans turned upside down. You may be unemployed for a season. If you're a health worker, you carry an extra burden, caring for the sick while guarding against infection. All of us have been learning about social distancing. Physically, it's essential for us to hold back from each other. For the sake of our neighbors, we want to do our part to stop the spread of this virus. Spiritually, though, we need the Lord Jesus Christ and we need each other more than ever. Psalm 139 was written in a time of conflict and pressure. Anxious, under threat, the psalmist invites us to pray with him, to experience the Lord as he does. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. When a baby's born, her parents examine her from head to toe. They search her face. They, they notice all her features, the shade of her skin, the rate of her breathing, whether she has any hair. Then as she grows, they, they watch for signs of an emerging personality. What makes her laugh? What makes her cry? What catches her attention? What makes her afraid? You know, the care that parents show their newborn daughter or newborn son is just a dim reflection of God's devotion to you and of his knowledge of you. You know when I sit and when I rise, the psalmist prays. You perceive my thoughts from afar. In an old Peanuts comic strip, Charlie Brown is outside at night. He's staring up at the sky. A friend says, aren't the stars beautiful, Charlie Brown? Uh-huh, he answers half-heartedly. A moment later, he says, let's go inside and watch television. I'm, I'm beginning to feel insignificant. Do you ever feel like that? You know, as human beings, we are tiny specks in a vast universe. And yet, marvel of marvels. The living God who spoke the galaxies into being, he knows us. Jesus said, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs on your head, whether they're just a few like mine or whether you have a full head, even the very hairs of your head are numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. He knows what's stocked in your fridge, what catches your eye on the street, what you worried about this past week, and what you're planning to do this afternoon. There's a large bowl of apples set out in the cafeteria of a Christian college. A staff member put up a note, take only one, please. God is watching. Nearby, a, a student left another message by a tray of cookies. It said, take all you want. God's watching the apples. It's silly, of course. God has no trouble absorbing all the information in our world. His knowledge is infinite and complete. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. What a beautiful gift this is. God isn't like a journalist with a video camera watching from a distance. He's not running a spy agency. His knowledge of us is personal, anchored in love. God knows your every thought. He will never misunderstand you, not one bit. God knows you and wants to be known by you. You hem me in behind and before. You lay your hand upon me. The Lord surrounds you on all sides. Do you know his hand is on you today? No event in your life, including in these past few weeks, has taken him by surprise. 
He's near. His hand rests on you. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. That word wonderful translates a Hebrew term referring to something puzzling, too hard to fully grasp or understand. Does it fill you with awe to consider how the Lord knows you and how close he is to you? He has created us for intimacy. Our hearts cry out for that. When it's missing, we, we hurt so deeply. We're, we're empty in our core. Because he's wired us for relationship with him, but, but also for relationship with others, for each other. That's why social distancing feels so strange. It, it disrupts our normal connections with friends, with colleagues, and with the community. A 60-year-old Italian man, Franco Arminio, was stuck in his house, like everyone else in Italy, unsettled and anxious. How could he fill the time? Well, last weekend, he published his cell number on social media. Anyone could call him, he said. I'm available every morning from 9 until noon. Well, within days, Antonio heard from more than 100 people. Bored, afraid, antsy, thinking about everything from quiet daily beauty to death. They talked to him about books, loneliness, and trees. A beekeeper said birds are quietly singing in the countryside. A factory worker said his plant had closed. An engineer said he had rediscovered the pleasure of being with his two children. One caller introduced herself as Louisa. I'm living right in front of the hospital of Varese, she said. I wake up to the sound of helicopters every morning. One person told Arminio, it's weird to see the mistrust in people's eyes. Another said, in these days, I'm learning how to live with myself. A student in Rome said, we don't know when we'll be able to hug our parents again. Some people feel alone, scared, and they know I'm scared too, Arminio told the, the Washington Post. It's as if they want to shiver a bit together. Tommaso phoned. His company is considering layoffs. Next was Francesca, for Francesco, who tried to imagine how the world might be changing. Then Rosa phoned. How are you feeling, Arminio asked. I'm okay, Rosa said. What about you? Arminio said he'd been tired and sad a day earlier, but now he was fine. Rosa said, I need to talk with people, touch them, physically share the moment. You get this? This is fundamental, Arminio said. And in these days, we're not allowed to do this. It's weird. Do you feel that? In one of his letters, the Apostle John said, I have much to write to you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. I think I'm understanding that better than ever. What a joy it will be when we can again meet in person. In, in the meantime, we will continue to be the church. We will keep seeking the Lord's direction. How can we encourage each other? How can we share the light and love of Jesus with our neighbors? I am praying that in the uncertainties and awkwardness of this time, we will each have that wonderful knowledge of the Lord's presence and his hand upon us. Where can I go from your spirit? The psalmist asks. Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in the grave, you are there. The, the Lord not only knows us, he pursues us. I know people who are terrified by this, ashamed to think that God perceives every thought, every movement, every word, and that there's no place to hide. Now, that's really our, our human condition, apart from Jesus Christ. Indeed, there's not a righteous person on earth who continually does good and never sins, the writer of Ecclesiastes says. And you know, in our sin, we can only flee from a holy God. We cannot be near him 
or we will die. And at the same time, separated from him, we perish. Praise God that he does not leave us like this. Praise God that in Jesus Christ, he came to seek and to save the lost. The Apostle Paul says God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I heard a radio interview with a man who was searching for his lost dog. David and Nicola Hunt were newlyweds. While they were on their honeymoon, their dog Holly ran away from her kennel near David's parents' home, 480 kilometers from Manchester, where, where the couple lived. Every weekend, they drove that distance to look for Holly. And after six months, they were exhausted. What would they do? Well, they did something I would never have considered. They quit their well-paying jobs, they sold their house, and they moved 480 kilometers to keep looking. Why is it so important for you to find this particular dog, David was asked. He said, well, it's not a particular dog. When I took Holly from the rescue shelter, I made a commitment that I would look after her. She had a traumatic past. I managed to bring her around to get her to trust me, and she turned into the most loving, warm little thing you've ever seen in your life. Now she's running around in a place she's not familiar with, and I just think that's wrong. She needs to be brought back into the environment that I know she thrives in. Well, I think that's a little over the top. As much as our family loves our dog, I would not make that kind of sacrifice for him. But what a picture this is of Jesus Christ, our good shepherd, who seeks us out. Now, he doesn't have any trouble tracking us down, of course. He knows exactly where we are. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. The Lord always knows where we are. Spiritually, though, he will not hold us against our will. But Jesus does seek us out. Come, follow me, he says. And what a change it makes when you understand that God pursues you, not to condemn you, but to save you. If you truly know, when you truly realize that Jesus Christ died to save you, that he has risen from the dead for your salvation, it frees you up, doesn't it? You can turn to him with joy. If God poured himself out for you on the cross, you can welcome his searching and you can revel in his knowledge of you just like the psalmist. In John 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish no one can snatch them out of my hand. God does the heavy lifting. If you let him, he will hold you. And that's the essence of faith. It rests far more on Jesus holding you than on how well you hold on to him. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light around me, the not light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. Does the Lord seem far away? Do you feel abandoned or overwhelmed by shadows? You know, there is no fog so thick, no darkness so heavy, that it can keep the Lord from finding you. God knows us as we are, not as we wish we were. And yet, relentlessly, in love, he searches us out to save us, to guide us, to hold us. How fully does he know us? The psalmist, just so poetically and powerfully, he prays, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. 
Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. You know, our bodies are designed so incredibly. Now, our health professionals, you know this far better than I do. I understand that, that in the average, the average heart pumps 6,000 to 7,500 liters of blood a day. More than 220 million liters of blood in a lifetime. Without any breaks, it will beat on average two and a half billion times. It's amazing. Our DNA contains 20,000 to 23,000 genes. About three meters of DNA are folded into each cell nucleus. A nucleus is six microns long. Apparently, that's like putting 30 miles of fishing line in a cherry pit. And it's just not just stuffed in, it's folded. I understand that if it's folded one way, it becomes a skin cell. If it goes another way, it's a liver cell, and so on. To write out all the information in one cell, it would take 300 books, each 500 pages thick. A human body contains enough DNA that if it were stretched out, it would circle our solar system. Our solar system. Not just once, but twice. What a miracle how the Lord has designed our bodies. And yet, we are so much more than that. Not just physical beings, we also have a soul and a spirit. The Lord has made us to commune with him to receive and to give love, to hear his voice, to understand his truth, to be filled with his Holy Spirit. All of this so that we can know him, that we can relate to him. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. God is the author of our story. Now, we have decisions to make, of course. The Lord doesn't script our lives without involving us, but in his sovereignty and in his kindness, he weaves the strands of our lives together in ways we don't fully understand. Now, this whole COVID-19 situation has not caught him off guard in the least. In his economy, none of the material of our lives gets wasted as we turn to him in faith. David continues, How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I'm still with you. Notice what happens as the songwriter meditates on the mind of God, on how the Lord gives his loving attention to us. You know, as David considers this, his own thoughts are filled with the beauty and majesty of God. Who has known the mind of the Lord, Isaiah asked. You know, the thoughts of our mighty creator, in a substantial way, they're a mystery to us. They're inaccessible, so far beyond what we can grasp. And, and yet, and yet, in his mercy, he does share some of his thoughts with us. 1 Corinthians 2, the Apostle Paul reflects on this, and he, he marvels on how the Holy Spirit reveals the reality of Jesus Christ to us. You know, in, in this time of social distancing, you may have extra opportunities. You may have little blocks of time you didn't have before to meditate on the thoughts of God. Charles Spurgeon pointed out that these verses in Psalm 139 are not hyperbole or exaggeration. He says, God's thoughts of love are so many that my mind never gets away from them. They surround me at all hours. I go to bed, and, and God is my last thought. And when I wake, I find my mind still hovering about his palace gates. God is ever with me, and I am ever with him. If during sleep my mind dreams, it only wanders upon holy ground. Can you say the same? 
I confess, I need the Holy Spirit's help with this. To keep my attention on Him, to avoid distraction, to remain in that place of awe before the Lord, captivated by His thoughts. Now, we could stop there with the first 18 inspirational verses of this psalm. But the Spirit of God led David to include the next section as well. It, it seems like an interruption. It, it intrudes into this uplifting flow of praise. If you think that God wants us to keep our prayers nice and pleasant, verses 19 to 22 come as a rude shock. If only you, God, would slay the wicked. Away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. Now, you know, the closer our relationship with God, the more sin becomes repulsive to us. We see how ugly it is, not just out there in other people, but also in ourselves. We grieve the damage it causes. If we know the Lord, we're not going to wink at wickedness. But, but that's not the final word. What does Jesus say? He says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Does this come naturally? No. <laughs> no. Our anger at sin easily morphs into hatred, hating our enemies. These, these verses in Psalm 139 are not pretty, but they model what to do with hatred. You know, as, as, as human beings, we, we need to pray our anger to, to bring it honestly to God, which is right where it belongs. You know, genuine intimacy requires us to be real before him. Sugar-coated prayers disguise what's really happening in us. The Lord knows what's behind our masks, of course, but he wants truth from us, honest dialogue. If there is hate lurking within us, it will not surprise him. But he does want us to come clean. If we pretend everything's fine, we are, in truth, putting up a wall. Essentially, we are saying, keep your distance, Lord. You know, it sounds more polite than that, of course, but any deception, any lie, any attempt to hide becomes a wedge in our relationship with him. God wants to hear our anger. He actually wants to hear our frustration and our confusion, just as he welcomes our adoration and our praise. This is how he changes us. We go to him as we are. Jesus died on the cross to forgive, to heal, and to restore us. You, you can't clean yourself up on your own. Only our Messiah, Jesus, crucified and risen from the dead, only he can do that. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. What are your fears today? What anxieties are eating at you? What losses are you grieving? Jesus Christ came into this world to lead us in his everlasting way. Through his Holy Spirit, he searches you and he knows you. His hand is on you. He is writing your story. This is not the last chapter, not by a long stretch. When we meet him at the cross, he always leads us into abundant resurrection life. Thank you so much for joining, joining me today. Please follow the link posted online in our GoToMeeting system or remain on your phone for some special music by John Hopper and then 
for an interactive time of sharing and prayer together. The Lord bless you and keep you.